basis. We don't often realize that we tend to treat all other types as our own because we don't know our own type. So that's the important insight. To know what you are different from, you must first know what you are similar to. The understanding of other types begins with the understanding of your own type. This is why I call my amalgamated version of type and temperament TNT, because it acts like dynamite to explode those mindsets, the prejudices, the insular basis, biases that we tend to pick up in our growth as socialized beings. As the Scottish poet Robbie Burns said, if we could only have the gift to see ourselves as others see us. In fact, the way we usually act, automatically following custom or automatically reacting against custom, is a result of the way others see us. In other words, we tend to play the role the social occasion offers and calls for, but we usually are not aware of the part we play, let alone of the whole play itself. TNT allows us to understand the part we play within the play, and in so doing it allows us to better understand different roles we may not like because they are not like us. Understanding does tend to extend tolerance to appreciation. Genuine tolerance comes from knowing types are unalterable and naturally different, and no amount of political ideology short of brute force will erase those differences. TNT teaches us that to know others you must know yourself. It demonstrates to us that we didn't even know we did not know. We were ignorant of our ignorance. As Montaigne said, our mind is an erratic, dangerous, and heedless tool. It is hard to impose order and moderation upon it. I would hardly dare tell of the vanity and weakness that I find in myself. My footing is so unsteady and so insecure and my sight so unreliable that on an empty stomach, I feel myself another man than after a meal. You may all experience that. It is of the obvious that we are oblivious. Familiarity breeds contempt because we do not recognize the face in the mirror as belonging to us. In other words, we tend to project what we do not like about ourselves onto others and locate the disease out there. TNT shows you that treating an orange like an apple will not somehow magically change it into an orange. Even if you have the power to make an orange pretend to be an apple, it still won't work. No matter how hard you squeeze an orange, you're never going to get apple juice from it. The lesson of TNT is that differences of personality are natural and innate and real. Life itself is about making distinctions and differentiating in order to survive. TNT makes unavoidable recognition of differences conscious, responsible, effective, and rewarding. Well now, let's get back to the book of yourself. The self-help manual you perhaps have yet to find in the great library of life. Or if you have finally located it, perhaps it still remains a foreign language to you. I suggest you may want to first and most fundamentally find out what you want. Really want. What will give you the most lasting satisfaction wherein you can make peace with yourself. Here's where my theme of finding and enacting your genius comes in. Once you've located your best-selling self-help book of yourself through TNT or some other method that can help you discover how you're organized, then you need to be able to read it. To decode those past passages of your life for the meaning you require to live more fully now and in the future. Montaigne says, a man who has not directed his life as a whole towards a definite goal cannot possibly set his particular actions in order. A man who does not have a picture of the whole in his head cannot possibly arrange the pieces. Our plans go astray because they have no direction or aim. No win works for the man who has no port of destination. I think what Montaigne is talking about is what I call genius. What I refer to genius as residing in each of us, Montaigne calls the pattern. There is no one who, if he listens to himself, does not discover in himself 
a pattern all his own, a ruling pattern which struggles against education and against the tempests of the passions that oppose it. As TNT will show you and Montaigne knew, natural inclinations gain assistance and strength from education, but they are scarcely to be changed and overcome. We do not root out these original qualities. We cover them up. We conceal them. Etymology, once again, can reveal the true meaning of the concepts that have formed the history of the word of genius. Besides our word genius, the words generation, genital, germinate, gene, genus as in classification, kin as in relative, ken as in knowing, K-E-N, kind as in likeness, can as in do or get done, cognition, know, noble, narrate, native, natal, nature, and nation all come from the same Indo-European base root, which means produce. Locked within the conceptual history of the word genius is the evolution of man and consciousness. The consciousness that made him and makes him both identical to yet wholly other than the lifeline from which he emerged. The genius that resides in each individual is what Montaigne means when he says, each man bears the entire form of man's estate. Lead the life of man in conformity with its natural condition. I do not teach, I tell. I study myself more than any other subject. That is my metaphysics. That is my physics. I would rather be an authority on myself than on Cicero. In the experience I have of myself, I find enough to make me wise. Also, Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher, wrote the genus is the formative principle in the mind. And the American transcendentalist writer Ralph, no less than Waldo Emerson, said of genius that it was to believe your own thought that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men. As etymology shows, genius is the declaration of being connected to the lineage and culture. It's the self-recognition of being a vital part of a developmental process. The whole of which articulates itself through you as a particular instance and proof of the unique creativity of evolution. It's an interesting and paradoxical thing that the more you tap your own unique source of knowledge and knowing, the more universal you find it is. You discover you are rooted in an evolutionary continuity which connects you far below the sparkling superficialities of fashionable ideologies that come and go quickly. We tend to worship geniuses in the West as eccentric, bizarre, self-destructive individuals. I don't think these are geniuses. They're madmen, social outcasts, deracinated persons, deracinated etymologically, cut off from their roots or those who refuse their roots, their continuity and their connection with their families, societies, and finally, life. These are the tortured, isolated depressives who in expressing their brilliant but superficial intellectual or artistic skills often rot in an autistic isolation rather than ripen in their common genius connected to the social sequence and its consequences. Another way of looking at your own unique genius is to understand each person as constantly transmitting its own form on some frequency no matter how weak. When we communicate however imperfectly we each tune into the other's transmission frequency and we decode or transform that message into our meaning. The trouble is, many of us are not transmitting our own message in the main. We are instead transmitting someone else's message. We are in effect acting as relay stations for another more powerful transmitter. Now, it's sometimes necessary to act as a relay station but that doesn't seem to satisfy us. 
we seem to need to have our own message be received and transformed into another by another so as to validate our meaning as a social transmitter. Another concept that accompanies the genius theme is intuition. The etymological meaning of intuition is having a tutor or a teacher within. The inward genius or tutor is what Montaigne meant when he said, the wise man is the keenest searcher for natural treasures. I accept with all my heart and with gratitude what nature has done for me and I am pleased with myself and proud of myself that I do. We must penetrate into the nature of things and clearly see exactly what it demands. I want to conclude with the topic of the West mental dis-ease, which I believe reflects the loss of our civilization's traditional order. I think we're all aware of the pervasive feeling of anxiety, frustration, depression, hopelessness, moral confusion, and barely contained violence that seems to be current. It sometimes seems that life is becoming nearly an unbearable burden for many only endured by substance and relationship abuse. I think the burden of the West is consciousness. Consciousness both as an autonomous, isolated individual and its collective of science and technology. Consciousness is our curse as well as our blessing. Consider, while the individual now is released from his traditional social constraints and has obtained a hitherto unknown range of personal freedoms, you can do what you want, and his collective consciousness of science and technology has granted the ordinary person material riches beyond the dreams of the most recent kings, and has doubled your life expectancy over 200 years, we now realize what a tremendous burden being conscious and having to choose is, especially when we must choose without an unconsciously accepted value base. Our personal freedom and long life has turned out for an increasing number of disenchanted individuals to be a meaninglessness and a source of despair. For the rootless individual is cut off from his family, his society, and life, and is dying of isolated loneliness. Western culture has turned into the public cultivation of private disease. This social psychic disease is a result, I think, of the maladaptation of man's biosocial organism to its consciously created scientific and technological society. It is consciousness's increasing separation from life that is at the heart of art of our dilemma. The West has lost the will to live because it has lost the meaning of life. The meaning and purpose of life is life itself. The overwhelming value of its continuance as expressed in the continuity of the human family and community. Note that the fertility rate in nearly every developed country in the world has dropped below replacement level since the 1970s. What clearer expression have we of the loss of the value of life than that we as a people cannot replace our dead with newborns? Consciousness is divisive and is the disease itself. Man is alienated and divided from himself, his family, society, and life. He is dying without meaning and without purpose. If Western man is to survive and continue, he will have to choose consciously to value life in all of its human and social forms. He will have to consciously renew the emotional connectivity of human relationship that was once unconsciously given to him and that he is now forsaken. That relationship expresses itself in individuals committed to caring for individuals not as ideologies but as flesh and blood relatives and as members of the community as the extended family. He will have to recognize, as Francis Bacon said, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. Biological male and female differences and the norm in social order will have to be readmitted as reality not erased by ideological wishes. 
we will have to choose either normal lifestyles or abnormal death styles. To me, the only cure for the West's diseased individuals is to care more for others and life than for one's own pursuit of self-stimulation and the ideology of the equality of death. Let Montaigne end for me. They want to get out of themselves and escape from man. That is madness. Instead of changing into angels, they change into beasts. Instead of raising themselves, they lower themselves. We seek other conditions because we do not understand the use of our own. <clears throat> we go outside ourselves because we do not know what it is like inside. Yet there is no use of our mounting on stilts. For on stilts we must still walk on our own legs. And on the loftiest throne in the world we are still sitting only on our own rump. The most beautiful lives to my mind are those that conform to the common human pattern with order but without miracle and without eccentricity. May I leave you all with what I hope will be a new or renewed interest in finding your own common human pattern if you have not yet found it or if you have lost it. And just to end on another serious note, I think, I hope that I have left you with your brain full. And thank you and good luck with your genius. Now, if we have enough time, I guess. If anyone wants to ask questions or if you would like, I, I did something. There's a manual of the MBTI that has in its back a section on careers of people that have taken in their database over in the states of uh, several hundreds of thousands. They, when you complete an indicator, you put what work you do and they have arranged a table of careers from that. And I looked up librarians. And if you're interested in that, I'll let you know about that now, or we can just talk in general about other things. Which would you rather do? Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks for that very challenging talk. Um, you set your notion of the sort of constancy from the personality of the against a view of the late 20th century as one giant pathological condition. I think, I think that if I read you right, that's virtually what you were saying. Now, one can think of many people throughout history, I mean, go from, from Jeremiah to Voltaire to Nietzsche, who also thought of their own times as one giant pathological condition. So in what ways are you distinguishing this pathological mm. condition? Good question. Because that's interesting. It is. That's a good question. You're quite right, and I don't argue that, that cultures, all of them, no matter how far back we go, Chinese, Mesopotamians 3,000, 4,000 years ago, all of them had basically the same complaints, i.e. the human condition. It's a complex subject. The best way I can answer it very quickly is to say how we differ in our disease from past times is that what I call ratio, reason of the Enlightenment's vein or science and technology, is a great deal different than the levels that it reached in earlier times.